Welcome to another edition of Hashtag Finance. I'm your host, Barrington Miller, and today I'm here with Robert Weekly, um, CEO, co-founder of Indus Holdings. Tell us about yourself. Well, thanks for having me. Excited <laughs> to be here. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's been a crazy journey, but, uh, you know, it's Indus Holding Inc. is, uh, you know, we've been around for five years now, really founded in January of uh, 2015 as a edible manufacturer, uh, one of the first licensed cannabis uh, manufacturers in California. And, uh, you know, we started making edibles uh, under a brand called Altai and then uh, continued to, to build a few brands and then become vertically integrated over the last five years with over 225,000 square feet of cultivation. We'll produce over 50,000 pounds of flour next year. Uh, volatile extraction, so we do all the shatter, crumble, concentrates, distillate, and then, uh, you know, we now own 14 brands. We represent over 40, and mm. we supply about 84% of all the licensed dispensaries throughout California. Wow. So it's been uh, all that in the last five years, and, you know, it was kind of a interesting story how we got started, as we've talked about before, is, you know, my background was restaurants and hospitality, and I worked for Hyatt Hotels for 13 years, and then... Uh, I remember, like, the, so um, for our listeners and people watching, um, we've actually gone out for dinner um, yeah. before this, like not last night. Um, <laughs> but uh, we 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 went out for dinner, and you were telling me that essentially you woke up one day. It was a, it was a one day thing. Like you, yeah. you woke up and that's it. All right, yep. I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna yep. make the change. Yeah, uh, <laughs> literally after building eight years of building four restaurants, a couple food and wine festivals, catering company, uh, left, and uh, six months later. Uh, started this um and it was really kind of seeing that opportunity and also as you know we talked about was you know at that time i had five-year-old twins and a and a three-year-old and i was home 37 days and nine months and uh you know back then also the majority of the the edibles and the cannabis products were saran wrapped brownies and cookies and rice krispie treats and being made in home kitchens or garages and with uh, the culinary background and hospitality, we thought there was this huge opportunity to be able to, you know, do branded edibles with real food science with my business partner, Mark Ainsworth. So the, the edibles market, as you know, in, in Canada will be launching supposedly in October. Uh, it's probably more like December, but yep. uh, what's what do we have to look forward to in Canada as far as that, that market? Like what's, what's California like? Is it... Um, I believe it's 10 milligrams per unit, maximum of 100 units. Yep. But prior to that, there were some products that were out there that uh, I heard <clears throat> 300 milligrams or some. There was 1,000 milligram like, bars. Oh, my God. You no. know, it's. I used to say all the time, I don't drink ever clear. <laughs> why, why would you ever eat 1,000 milligrams of THC? Um, but no, it's, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the great thing for Canada is you get a new way to ingest, you know, cannabis. Uh, if you don't like to smoke um, or whatever, you can have a piece of chocolate now or a gummy or you know, something like that, and especially for sleep at night. Uh, I think you'll start to see... Um, more and more uh, consumers, and that's what we're seeing in California, is it's becoming, you know, just very socially acceptable, just like having a glass of wine uh, or a beer um, at the end of the day. How great is it now where you can come home and you can pop a mint in your mouth or, or take a piece of chocolate, and in 30, 45 minutes, you've relaxed from the day's worth of work, and you can actually pay attention to your family and you know, um, go that way. Or, you know, my mother uses it for sleep uh, on a daily basis now. It's kind of funny how quickly you know, my, my grandparents are in their 90s and live in Florida. And, uh, you know, they now are like, hey, it's CBD. Um, you know, it's uh, it's yeah. it's amazing how quickly. Uh, again, I live on the West Coast in California and we're a little ahead of everything usually anyways. Right. with uh, But it's so socially acceptable now. Um, it's uh, it's great to see the movement. I think uh, it'd be great in Canada to get the edibles up here in brands. As far as actual products, um, you mentioned like brownies and cookies and gummies. What what seems to be the popular one, or does it does it uh, does it matter with demographics? Like kids, twenty one to <laughs> kids. Yeah, um, we, don't, we, we don't we don't let kids have our product. No kids. Young, Come on, <laughs> young, young, yeah. young adults. Um, yes. uh, like say twenty one to thirty, and then thirty to forty. Is there is there different or is it? Uh... There definitely is. Um, I mean, flour and vape pens are still the biggest uh, market uh, in the smokables. So when it comes to edibles, gummies, 
uh, is definitely the lion's share. Uh, and then chocolates, hard candies, uh, mints. Mm-hmm. Um, but gummies are big. Uh, you know, the millennials and stuff uh, love the concentrates, uh, which is more the higher <laughs> dose, you know, uh, stuff. But, um, you know, I think uh, the, you know, uh, 40 to 60 is uh, female customers, one of the fastest growing markets right now. Oh, wow. And uh, that's a lot of edibles, right? It's, you know, grab a gummy and, and relax, helps with sleep, um, you know, and stuff like that. Now, tell us a little bit about how how you got here, because we were talking about this uh, off camera, uh, how you obtained some licenses and just the the stringent nature that you use um, in your facilities with your products and just setting a really, really high standard uh, about the way you conduct your business. Sure. I mean, you know, uh, I grew up or not didn't grow up, but I've spent the last 18 years in uh, in Monterey. And uh, that's where my restaurants, you know, a few of them were and everything else and where my family uh, and the kids went to school. So when I decided to get into this industry, it was like, okay, if we're going to do that, we got to do it right. Um, And so met with the mayor, the city manager, city attorney in uh, in Salinas. And they're like, Rob, we've been wanting you to come do business here, but not. (laughs) We were thinking (laughs) restaurants, not not cannabis. They're like, you know, we have a moratorium against uh, cannabis. And I was like, okay, well, they're like I'm like, what's that mean? And they're like, well, you can't have, you can't do a dispensary and you can't do cultivation. We have more term. I said, well, I don't want to do either. Right. I want to, I want to make edibles. And they're like, well, what's that? And I'm like, it's a manufacturing thing. We're going to make chocolate and uh, everything else. We're going to, in essence, have a facility that could produce products for Whole Foods. We're just going to have one extra ingredient. And uh, right. they're like, oh, give us a minute. And uh, they're like, we'll get back to you about three hours later. We get a call and he's like, yeah, there's nothing in the books that says you can't do that. So you essentially and helped create the so, laws. <laughs> so we literally filled out the license right there. And uh, that afternoon, I got a license for $212. Um, I went over to the city clerk's desk and got a license uh, to make infused cannabis products. Um, I got a phone call about, the, you know, obviously I'm running out the doors. You <laughs> absolutely. Know, absolutely. You know, just, heels. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Um, and uh, called my business partner and was like, this is what we, we got it. Like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> I can't and, believe we Nobody got said it. it doesn't even exist. And uh, we got a phone call three hours later from the clerk's office saying, hey, there's been a mistake. You need to return that license. Um, we have a nope, moratorium. Nope, nope. Was, I'm not returning. Like, I'm already on a plane. No, I'm gone. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I was like, uh, I don't think there's a mistake. They're like, yeah, we have a moratorium. I said, no, I've already met with the mayor and the city manager and the and the city attorney. And they're like, let us get back to you. Calls me back 30 minutes. Says, nope, you're all good. Have a nice day. And uh, that's kind of how it started. And then about a month later, the city council had a had the city council <laughs> meeting and uh, put it on the ballot for a moratorium against manufacturing of cannabis <laughs> products also. And uh, but we were grandfathered in. And uh, so that moratorium was up for almost two years uh, as we were the only licensed cannabis manufacturer there. And then we helped and worked with the city uh, very closely to start shaping regulations and different things to uh you know, fully legalize it and everything else um, a few years back. So you <laughs> you had a two year head start. Yeah. Uh, what did you What did you learn in those two years? Um, because you're just sort how of how to make mistakes. <laughs> how to make <laughs> all the mistakes. <laughs> um, what was if you could give somebody uh, some advice who wanted to start doing what you're doing mm-hmm. um, based on those two years? What did you What did you learn? What would you tell them? Run, <laughs> run, run really fast. Uh, no, you know, it was interesting. It was, um, you know, I thought it was going to be a lot easier. Uh, I was like, yeah, it's been going around forever. But then, you know, with the amount of regulations and to do everything by the book and and uh, to set things up, it was uh, always know that in this industry, it's going to take twice as long and cost twice as much right. than what you think. So okay. literally take your business plan and everything you plan on doing, just double double it, and you might be lucky enough to, to actually to hit to be it, within but, the but range. you're still probably going to be late and, <laughs> and over budget. Um, it's uh, one of those things. But it, I think, um, you know, it's exciting now. You know, back then there wasn't a whole lot of framework and regulations. So what we had to do was, you know, I had to go, I had looked at Colorado and said, okay, what are their regulations? Mm-hmm. So we set, we set most of our regulations based on, you know, Colorado and Washington. We knew Oregon had the strictest pesticide standards in the cannabis business. There were no pesticide standards in California up until two years ago. Um, And so we adopted five years ago or four years ago, Oregon standard pesticides um, so that we were already ready for when California 
went because we always knew California was never going to be less regulated than any other state. <laughs> <Right>. California <laughs> loves to regulate. Mm -hmm. And um, so we literally just took the strictest standards that we could find throughout the U.S. and the states that legalized before California and adopted those and kind of built the business. So it's like, on a, that. like a Frankenstein patchwork of, of uh, regulations from various states. Um, Taking the strictest standards. Yeah. It was but. tough back then because you'd be, be like driving down the road and there's no speed limit signs and you get pulled over for speeding. It's like, right. well, there's no speed limit. They're like, yeah, well, you know, you're, today there is. You're going today over. It's Whatever 50. it is, it's, yeah. it, it's and, too and, fast. And so, you know, that's the way it was in California because there literally was no regulations. Um, there was no lab testing mandatory. There was no pesticide standards, nothing. And since day one with Indus, we've we've lab tested every one of our products. We've stuck to, you know, like I said, those strictest standards because we knew where the future was going. Right. And we wanted to make sure we were a leader in that. And as we were to grow the business, that we worked very closely with the politicians and law enforcement. We actually hired the police chief in Salinas, um, 32 years on the force, and uh, he's our chief compliance officer. <laughs> so he's got one of the hardest jobs. He has to keep us in line. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was how how over the top we wanted to be literally to hire a police chief to come in and make sure and so he oversees not only our licensing and our security and compliance and everything else but also our community involvement in giving back to the community and and doing uh, our community plans well we've done a we did a podcast on um, the uh, social responsibility uh, and we did concentrate in california um, for those listening you can tune into our other podcast uh, that I did uh, featuring that topic. Now, California itself is a unique, unique beast, <laughs> country, animal. It's its own thing. Uh, and I've been, when I talk to different people, they say Northern California is a lot different than Southern California in Very. terms of, of regulations. What's your experience with that? Um, no, I mean, listen, it's a big state, right? We have 3 million more people than all of Canada. Yes. It was the sixth largest <laughs> economy in the world and the largest cannabis economy in the world. Um, but yeah, they're very different. I mean, to the point of almost night and day where Northern California, almost all male bud tenders, like uh, a lot of male bud tenders, Southern okay. California, all female bud tenders. It's, huh. it's, it's that crazy on, on so many differences <laughs> like that. Um, you know, we, we I, see I the wonder, difference. I wonder why that, why that it, is. <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. Same thing. We've got brands that do really well in Northern California and don't in Southern California. Um, you know, Sativa Indica, it, it's. It's interesting. Um, you know, most of the regulations now in California have been worked out to where the states come out with their regulations and everybody goes by those. There's a few things in different cities and counties, um, you know, tax purposes, stuff like that. But for the most part, you know, California is over the last kind of 18 months has worked out most of the regulatory inconsistencies and uh, moving it forward there. So I've also spoken with some other cannabis companies in California and you and your company have a very, very good reputation, and um, you're known for helping other companies out. And I'm, and when we were talking at dinner, you, you attributed to the um, to the food industry. Like if there's a local restaurant and they're uh, short on something, and you're next door and they need it, you help each other out. Yeah, and, we call um, competition. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's listen. We all need to work together to build this industry. There's plenty of space for all of us. And I think the biggest thing is we want to make sure that we work together to have the good good actors and good players to, to bring this industry um, complete legitimacy. Um, but yeah, our, our whole thing was like back in restaurants, the restaurant down the street ran out of, you know, Grey Goose. It was like, hey, borrow a bottle. I'll get it back to you tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the same thing. It's like somebody has an issue with their cultivation or with uh, getting oil. It's like, hey, let us help you out. Let's figure out what we do um, to work together to, to better because, you know, you never know when you need it you know, help or, or anything else. So it's, it's good. And with that, we'll take a short break and we'll be back momentarily. We're social here at the CSE. Each and every day, we'll keep you up to date on trending topics that investors are talking about, such as cannabis, blockchain, and esports. Follow daily CSE news and events on your favorite social media platform, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You'll find exclusive interviews with leading entrepreneurs from a variety of industries thought-provoking stories from across the world of finance and updates from CSE events taking place worldwide. Join the conversation and connect with us today. And we're back. Um, I'm here with uh, Robert Weekly from Indus Holdings. And 
where we left off was helping each other out. Uh, Coopetition, I believe, is the yeah. term. Um, let's talk a little bit about your 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 plans outside of California, um, expanding past those borders. Um, what's in store for Indus? Sure. You know, we went public about four months ago now <laughs> yeah. uh, here on the CSC, and um, uh, we've now looked at our expansion plans and working things out. So we've actually acquired a, a business out of uh, Nevada and Oregon. So we're very excited about that. Uh, you know, it's a 76,000 square foot uh, facility in Nevada and uh, about 6,000 in Oregon. And in Nevada, we've got full indoor cultivation, extraction, manufacturing, and distribution. It was a brand called W Vapes. Um, and now we're able to take all of our brands from California and drop them right into Nevada. Um, we're two miles off the Vegas Strip. Oh, and, perfect. you know, for years we've been getting phone calls from a lot of our customers or emails saying, hey, I'm going to Vegas or I'm going to Tahoe. Uh, for the weekend, where can I find your products? And I would always have to say, ah, we're not there yet. Right. And so you never want your customers leaving and going having somebody else's product when they're on vacation. Right. And so, you know, if you look at Vegas and, and Nevada, they see over 50 million visitors a year. Um, and, tour, and, you know, almost over a third of those come from California. So it's a great spot to. That's a, that's a no brainer. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to start rolling out here in Q4 some of our brands. Mm -hmm. into uh, into Nevada and into Oregon, and uh, we'll continue to look at that. We look at very strategic states um, where we typically like to acquire a company that's already up and existing and, and has the footprint, so it doesn't take us a lot of capital to go and build the infrastructure and everything needed uh, to bring our brands into the market. We really look at ourselves as, you know, our, our two core focuses, as much as we're vertically integrated, our two core focuses is brand building and distribution. Um, we want to build, you know, the Jack Daniels and the and the Maker's Mark and the Absolute of of the cannabis industry uh, for you know twenty five years from now. Let's let's talk about politics uh, on the federal level in the United States. What what do you think is going to happen? You know, it's uh, it's tricky. We, we continue to watch it, and we're very active uh, politically and uh, and stuff. I believe federal legalization is coming right around the corner. Uh, you know. People will come back. People are gonna on, ask, like, I think. I is think it it's, coming this year? Is it coming next year? Well, it's is not it, coming ugh. this year, but I think uh, I, I really feel 2020 uh, could be the year. Um, obviously, with Canada and everything going on, um, you know, there's a couple acts right now in Congress. You have, you know, the Safe Banking Act, which is which would be huge, yeah. which would open up banking for our industry there, and uh, which is lending and everything else. And then also, you know, the states' rights, which would, in essence, almost legalize it right there. Right. Um, so there's there's a lot of things people don't realize. It's not that hard on the federal level, actually, with legalization, because there's no federal alcohol policies in the United States. It's states' rights. Um, right. The All states make their own alcohol policy, whether what time they sell alcohol or drinking age, anything else. Um, federal government, let's go. It's the same thing, cannabis. It just needs to be descheduled. And all of a sudden, it's federally legal. Um, and so, you know, we do think it's around the corner and are very optimistic on that and, uh, and where things are going. Now, as far as the, as far as the future of the industry, uh, one of your talks that you gave, you were talking about a, a massive consolidation um, in the industry. Uh, can you speak a little bit to sure. that? Yeah, I think, you know... Uh, as any industry continues to evolve and grow, there's consolidation happens. And I think the, the biggest is distribution. Yeah. Um, you know, when I owned restaurants, I had about 800 SKUs when you talk about all the beer, wine, liquor, and everything else. I had right. three suppliers. The average dispensary now has four to 500 SKUs and has 50 to 100 suppliers. Yeah. That's 50 or 100 different people <laughs> they don't know coming in the back door, different invoices, payment terms, everything else. The dispensaries are looking for massive consolidation there. Uh, they, you know, what we hear is three to five is where they'd like to get to. And, you know, most of our referrals for brands and stuff come from dispensaries. So they're like, listen, uh, somebody comes in, they're like, we like your brand, we like your product, but we're not going to buy a single brownie or a mint or a, right. you know, whatever from one person. Like, go, go find a distributor, go to Indus, and then we'll pick up your product from them so that it's on one invoice and uh, one delivery driver. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so let's... Uh... Let's let's get away from cannabis and let's talk about food. Yeah. Uh, With this body, you can tell I like food. <laughs> yeah, well, you're not alone. <laughs> um, what's your what's your go to meal when you're on the road? Because 
apparently you live in a plane. <laughs> so I pretty much live in a plane. Yeah, it's about 140 flights already this year. Um, you know, it's uh, it depends on where I am. Uh, I love sushi is one of the great things, especially when you're flying. You're not, you know, I also love Italian food, but it doesn't uh, doesn't sit well when you're sitting on planes all the time. Uh, so, you know, it always depends on which city and, and where I am, depending on things. You know, New York, I always love it's, you know, go to Blue Ribbon Sushi and stuff like that. Another sponsorship. <laughs> um, but well, Blue uh, Ribbon, send over sushi. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it uh, it always depends on, on where I am. You know, up here in Toronto is, uh, you know, a little different. Now, what do you feed your 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 kids at home? What uh, you have three of them, um, yeah. and you know it's a it's a blessing yes. <laughs> at times. But you got to feed them. What does uh, what does a typical meal uh, look like in your household? Chicken tenders. <laughs> That's what they want every day. That and, and uh, bagel bites. Uh, no, we try. Uh, you know, it's, I, I try to push them to get uh, to experiment on things. I always just ask them. Listen, if you don't like it, but I, I expect them to taste uh, right. pretty much everything. So, you know, steak tartare, uh, I've had them taste. Uh, You've you had know. them taste? Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, no. uh, you know, you got to get them, get them out. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, no, you know, they're they're pretty normal in their in their dining habits. I try to uh, to get them to, to experiment. But they really like steak also. Um, so they'll medium Good. rare, you know. So I, I've got them there at least. They're not eating well-done beef. They wouldn't have. They wouldn't be my kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's awesome. They disown you. Um, well, I think we're going to be wrapping up. Um, this is uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful chat. Thank you for stopping by the seventy second floor of First Canadian Place. Yes, congratulations um, on your new uh, well, new digs. Oh, well, thank you. I definitely have the best view in the office um, today. You can see uh, Niagara Falls. Yeah, so, it's uh, beautiful. Yeah, um, but yes, thank you for stopping by. And this has been another episode of Hashtag Finance. I've been Barry Miller with Robert Weekly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, it's Grace from the CSC reminding you to make sure to follow us on social media for the latest updates on our listed companies as well as new listing alerts. For more in-depth content, be sure to pick up our free quarterly magazine, Public Entrepreneur, available online at thecsc.com.